Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is uh, truly a pleasure to be with you this morning. I want to thank you for ministering to me this morning through your welcome, through your songs, through your singing, through your worship, through your prayers. It's just been wonderful and is wonderful to be with you this morning. And as it's been mentioned, I, uh, I work for Churches of Christ. It's something I'm still coming to grips with. <laughs> Because I walk into certain situations and people think that I'm from head office. Now, I've never been from head office in my life. I left school at 16, was an apprentice motor mechanic. I've never had anything to do with any head office except when I was in trouble. <laughs> so it's still a little unnerving for me to be kind of connected with head office. So, but I'm getting, I'm getting to grips with it. I want to tell you four stories this morning. Now this is really important that there's four stories because I know because if I go too long, you can go, okay, at least he's up to story three. There's only, there's only one to go, you know? Absolutely. Um, coming to, into this role at Churches of Christ three months ago, uh, I kind of, I knew a little bit about Church of Christ world, but coming into this role has been an eye-opener. And I wanted to share with you a few things from my perspective on Churches of Christ, um, as I represent head office here this morning, if you're watching. <laughs> churches of Christ are involved in lots of things. Obviously, there, there are the Churches of Christ, you guys. But Churches of Christ as an organisation do foster and kinship care of children. Um, just down the road here, there's a, 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 great, a great headquarters that keeps families together. They train and assist young people. They provide and manage affordable and social housing. They provide retirement living, home care, and residential care for the elderly. Churches of Christ do a lot of things. And one of the things is someone new to the scene is asking why. Why are Churches of Christ doing these things and why are Church of Christ doing these things? What happened? And I was part of my indoctrination, um, no, orientation, <laughs> into Churches of Christ. They run a thing at Kenmore called Launchpad. And I went along and one after the other they tell the stories of Churches of Christ. And it was in one of these stories that I think I found the, the answer to why why you do what you do. And someone told a story of a, of a church in the 60s. And um, it was a normal Sunday morning, but one significant family were absent. They knew they were absent because they were a large family, they had eight children. So they weren't at church that morning, and a few people said, I wonder what's going on. So they went around and visited them after the service, concerned about them, and found that life had become too difficult for the parents. And they had actually abandoned their children. We don't know the circumstances, we don't know the story, but there were eight children who for at least a few days had been fending for themselves. So obviously the authorities were called in and that family was um, fostered out into all sorts of families around Queensland. This situation didn't sit well with that church community that this family that they knew and loved was now spread out around Queensland, that they were split up. So they went to Churches of Christ, and Churches of Gov Ch Christ went to the government, and things started to happen. And in July 1970, Churches of Christ officially moved into the realm of caring for vulnerable children and families. The first family group home was built in Maryborough, the site of that Church of Christ church. And that started because a church community loved their neighbours. As I listen to that story, and I have the great pleasure now of telling Churches of Christ their own story. That's an origin story. Origin stories are always significant because they answer the question why. When we go on in history, we start, we do things, but we often don't answer the question of why. The origin stories tell us the reason why why we do those things. Churches of Christ demonstrated and continue to demonstrate that they, have, uh, they are people who are receiving God's love. They're experiencing God's love and they're sharing God's love with others. 
They do enormous things. And why do they do them? Because we are God's people who are constantly receiving God's love and demonstrating His reality by sharing that love with others. That's why you come down on Wednesdays and pack handles. That's why you're collecting cans. That's why you do what you do. Because you are God's people. You have received and are receiving God's love and you share the reality of that by loving others in all sorts of wonderful and significant ways. That's the first story. The second story. Tick one box. Is God's big story. I think as God's people, we need to be reminded that we are part of a much bigger story. Sometimes in church life, we can get a little isolated. We do our own thing in our own little suburb and all the rest of it. But when we recognise that we, each of us, are part of God's big story. This is an outline that I wanted to share with you this morning. Uh, made famous by a bloke called Daniel Chong and recently updated by a fellow called Dave Benson. It's a way of understanding the whole of God's story, the whole of the story of the Bible. It has a beginning. And we recognise that in the beginning, God's story starts with humanity being designed for good. That's the way it started. It was a good humanity. It was a good creation. Nothing separated us from God or each other. Everything that God created operated in perfect <coughs> harmony. It was good. We were designed for good, not just humanity, the whole of creation. We look around our world and we recognise that's not the way it is. We look at chaos and tragedy and viruses and pandemics and bad news. The second movement in the story, the big story, is that we've been damaged by evil. Relationships with God, relationships with each other have been fractured. Sin has entered the world. Sin has entered our world and creation. We live autonomously. We live separated from God. We are our own kings running our own lives, often at the expense of others. The third movement is that we have been restored for better. God in all his grace and love looks at his fraction, creation, and he does something about it. Jesus, God's Son, enters our world as one of us, and through his life, death, resurrection, and exaltation, that broken humanity can be restored for better, made right, rescued, restored, redeemed, all those Christian words that we know. We are a new creation. We have been restored. And this is good news. I always reckon that's kind of underselling it. It's the good news. It's amazing news, isn't it? Have you experienced that good news? Are you experiencing that good news? Have you been restored for better? It's just not good news for us. Church, this is something we really need to get our heads around. It is good news for us, but it's not just good news for us. It's good news for creation. It's good news for humanity. This is good news for the neighbourhood because we're set together to heal. We have a purpose. We know what we're doing. We cooperate with God as He recreates. We have a purpose. We are set together to heal. To take the good news of the reality and love of Jesus Christ to others. So that's the big story, but this is the significance that I want you to remember. That because we are who we are, because we have been restored for good, for better, we are a community of kingdom access people. When I joined Churches of Christ, they emphasised KAP, Kingdom Access Places. We are Kingdom Access people. When we come in contact with, with people, we have the privilege of opening the door so that they can have access to the Kingdom. We live representing and reflecting Jesus in our everyday lives. So, if you forget everything else that I've said this morning, and you probably will, can you remember those four things? 
that four outline movements of the big story. Design for good. Damaged by evil. Restored for better. Set together to heal. That not only tells us who we are, it also informs who other people are. It shows us that there is hope. There is a plan. There is a path. There is a way. People are, people are, are never write-offs. There's always can be restored for hope. Second story, done and dusted. The big story. Third story, my story. I was born into a Christian home. Church was part of my life. Um, my parents were workaholic Christians. They did everything in an inner city Baptist church. I went to Sunday school and I heard story after story after story on a Sunday morning, playing in sand pits, flannel graph boards, the whole thing. I thought I knew the big story. By the time I'd become an adult, I must have heard all the stories. I thought I knew them. But my story was a little bit different. And I'm wondering this morning if, if this is the story that you have. Because it's the story that I had. I could understand designed for good. Yes, that's how God created His creation. Damaged by evil. Happy to put my hand up for that one. But this is where my story had a little deviation from the story outline we had a little bit earlier. My story went to the next movement was Save for Heaven. Now, hear me really clearly this morning. I absolutely believe that coming into our, our relationship with Jesus Christ saves us for heaven. But the way I understood the big story was it was kind of a full stop after that. Designed for good, damaged by evil, saved for heaven. Jesus came, he died on the cross, I can receive forgiveness, and when I die, I go to him to be with him in heaven. Full stop. As a young man, I wondered, well, what happens in between? What do I do now? I was a young man, I was fit and energetic, and I wanted to change the world. And it seemed to me that the focus of Christianity was the afterlife, not my life now. What, what do I do? What do I get my teeth into? How, I, how do I get exhausted for God? Do I just keep going to church? Nothing wrong with church, but is that all there is to it? So, I found myself at Bible College. Um, I'd been involved in church, as I said, and a number of people over many years said, Stuart, you need to go to Bible College. Now, I left school at 16. I had no idea about going to Bible college. I thought an assignment was something that James Bond accepted. Didn't have a I didn't have a clue. But I, I, I'd made this deal with God. I said, God, I'll go to night lectures. And if I pass, I'll think about it. So I'd work all day as a motor mechanic, drive halfway across the world to go to Bible college, and within 10 minutes was asleep. So I got a lot out of it. But there was one night... And I remember where I was sitting, I remember what it looked like from my perspective. And the lecturer got up and he started talking about the good news. And I initially started to glaze over because I thought, yep, designed for good, damaged by evil, Jesus came, died on the cross so I can go to heaven. Yep, okay, I think I should pass this exam. And he started to talk about the good news of the kingdom of God. And I thought, well, I know about the good news, but what's this kingdom stuff? And then he went through, and I've got, we've got the slides up here, and he pointed out how every gospel started with Jesus announcing the good news of the kingdom. Not just the good news, but the good news of the kingdom, Matthew 4.23. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. 
That's Matthew. Let's go to Mark. Chapter 1, verse 14. I want to convince you. <laughs> now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel, the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Still not convinced? Luke chapter 4, uh, verse 43. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to all the towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And lastly, John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. As soon as he spoke those words, the good news of the kingdom, it was like, you know when you're looking, you're looking to buy a new car, and when you're thinking about the car you want to buy, you see them everywhere? I started to see the kingdom of God everywhere. The parables, Matthew chapter 13, for example, there's a whole chunk of parables called the parables of the kingdom. Matthew 13, the kingdom of God is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Verse 30, 31, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. What a great parable. It talks about the bigness of smallness. See the size of a mustard seed? It says the small things humble the big things when they're in God's hands. And I've got to say to you, church, this morning, that maybe the message of Caboolture Church of Christ, you may think you're small, but maybe in God's hands you are massive. There might be not many people here this morning, but your reach beyond this building on a Sunday morning is enormous. Wonder whether our success was measured in our influence, not in our attendance. Parable of the parable of the, verse 33, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. The kingdom of verse 44, the kingdom is like the are you convinced? The kingdom of getting exhausted. The kingdom is like the treasure hidden in the field. Verse 47, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. There are parables of the kingdom. We're taught to pray for the kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done. It's everywhere. We're told to seek first the kingdom of God. So what is it? If it's so important, what is the kingdom of God? Um, you can do a search on Google and there's a thousand million theological um, definitions for the kingdom of God. This is my favourite. Now you've got to keep in mind that I am an expert mechanic, so I like things simple. The kingdom of God is anywhere, anytime God gets what he wants. Where God rules, where God reigns, anywhere, anytime God receives what he desires. Just so I cover all the bases, Scott McKnight, a great New Testament scholar, says this about the kingdom. It's King Jesus who reigns by redeeming and governing people who follow his will, bringing his reality into their places. It's about a king. That's the thing about the kingdom. And I think as a young man, the whole idea of the kingdom got excited me. I started to think about Camelot and horses and knights and, and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, it engaged my imagination. It, imagine what it could have been. You know, the caravan. You know, the caravan of God. Not the kingdom of God, the caravan. Or the suburb of God. Or even the town of God. That's the kingdom of God. Where a king reigns and rules where the king gets what he wants. And that king is King Jesus. That's the importance of Jesus being taken to heaven because he's on the right hand of the Father. He rules and reigns in heaven. That's reality. He reigns by redeeming and governing. You know what? We all need leadership. And, and Jesus provides the leadership and the governing we need. And we follow him. I mean, actually follow him like disciples in his footsteps. Not theoretically, but actually. We really follow him. We bring his will into reality. Not our will, not our individual will, not our collective will, but his will. And what's his will? That we are set together to heal. That's what we work towards. And we bring the, that into our places where we go. The great thing about understanding the kingdom of God is we don't have to change anything. Wherever we go, the people and places, 
that are already a part of our life, we take the kingdom of God with us. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We represent King Jesus in our places. We're restored together, so we're sent together to heal. As God's people, we actively participate in God's subversive, inevitable, perfect kingdom. Now, the kingdom of God has come. Fully? Not yet. But it will. But we are, as God's people, an incredible opportunity to be part of what God is already doing in our creation, in our world. We don't have to wait. We can be part of that kingdom now and see it unfold right before our lives, in our community, in our neighbourhoods, in our cities, in our world. That is story three. One more. It's a short one. Well, no, I shouldn't say that. It's your story. It's the Gibraltar Church of Christ story. This morning, church, my prayer is that you would recognize yourself as kingdom access people. You have been called, you've been equipped, you've been given the purpose, the good news of the kingdom of God. The story of God is an unfinished story. This is the cool thing. I'm going to finish my story in a moment. But you guys are still involved in writing God's story. It's not finished. The canon of the Bible may be closed, but the story of God's kingdom is ongoing. And we can be part of that story. How cool is that? Have you got your favourite story? Imagine actually being in that story. Imagine being a character in that story. Imagine being the hero in that story. Imagine being the sidekick in that story. I don't want you to imagine being the villain in that story. But imagine you can be part of an epic story. Your favourite story. This is the reality of being part of the kingdom. Jesus is saying, come on church, be part of my story. You're integral. You're the way I'm going to do it. You're the... Kingdom access people. You have the opportunity of telling the story of an alternative kingdom. We live in a kingdom. We live in a kingdom that is overconfident, superficial, and consumer driven. We already live in a, in, a, in, a, in a kingdom, but we have the opportunity of offering another story, another kingdom. We haven't been able to go to the movies for a while. I think we can now. You know when you go to the movies, they have the trailers at the beginning, the previews, and the whole idea of the trailers is that they show you just a snapshot, a glimpse, a bit, so you'll come back and watch the main event. So they, they try and, you know, hook you in. They don't show you the whole thing, it just says a glimpse. And you go, don't you? You sit there and you go, you turn to your, your person you're with and you go, mm, that looks good, doesn't it? <laughs> It's exactly the whole idea of a preview. Someone has described the church as a preview of the kingdom. It's not the kingdom, but it should give people a glimpse, a little snapshot, a little preview, enough for them to go, hmm, I want to be a part of that. Looks good. We should go. Church, thank you for putting up with me this morning. I really look forward to a cup of tea and a couple of biscuits. And um, I have to apologise if my throat's played up. I think I blew a gasket singing that hymn. <laughs> but um, thank you for your generosity. And can I pray for you? Heavenly Father, I want you to encourage these people this morning. Individually, Lord Jesus, encourage them. Not through my words, but through your spirit. Right now, as we sit together uh, in your presence, Lord Jesus, Lord, just collect, uh, individually encourage us. Collectively, Lord Jesus, put your arm around us and say, well done. Thank you for being my kingdom access people. Lord, I pray that this morning through what you've said, you've breathed meaning and purpose into so many things that this congregation is already doing. And maybe they kind of understand more clearly the why behind it. And Lord, we pray for the future. 
that unwritten story that we have the privilege of being part of. And Lord, we cannot wait to see the next chapter. It's going to be awesome, Lord. So thank you for inviting us into it. Lord, we thank you uh, for being here this morning. We thank you that wherever we go, you go with us. And Lord, we thank you for that you are our Lord and Savior this morning. We pray these things in your wonderful name. Amen. 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 Let me pray for you, Stuart. Sure. Uh, I'm going to pray for Stuart in his role across our region and uh, as he goes into churches, as he works with our uh, care agencies. I just want to pray for you. Lord. That's better. Father God, bless Stuart, I pray, Lord. Thank you for the word that he's brought to us today, Lord God. And may we give people a glimpse of heaven, Father God. Mm. Thank you that we can indeed be your hands and feet. Lord, I pray you watch over him as he travels. Uh, some days quite a few kilometres up and down the highways and byways, uh, connecting with our churches and pastors, connecting with our care agencies, Father God. And Lord, as he goes into different meetings and different offices, Lord, I pray that he just brings a spirit of truth and wisdom. Lord, open his eyes, continue to show him the things that he needs to see. Lord, I thank you that you have called him for this time. And the best is yet to come. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you, Stuart.